Good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is Jonathan Gales. I'm professor and chair of the Department of African American Studies here at Georgia State University. Uh, sitting in a, an overwhelmingly dark room. I did not uh, uh, realize that it was so dark. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend who has really in many ways taken, not in many ways, she's taken the leadership of this effort to uh, bring the Freedom School to fruition. The Freedom School um, was an effort that started last semester to really blur the boundaries or, or eliminate the boundaries between community knowledge and campus knowledge. And we're very excited to, to have a partner like Avenue, Avenue Research Library and it is my honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Lakita Bennett Bailey, who is currently Associate Professor of African American Studies, soon to be Africana Studies at Georgia State University. And she is the pre-PhD faculty associate for the Center for the Advancement of Students and Alumni, also known as CASA. Her research interests include hip hop culture, political behavior, political attitudes, African American politics, political psychology, and public opinion. Her current research examines the impact of political rap music on racial attitudes, and she has had a forthcoming co-edited, she has a um, forthcoming co-edited volume with Adolphus Beck Belk Jr. entitled For the Culture, Hip Hop and Social Justice. This will be published by University of Michigan Press. This uh, manuscript examines the relationship between hip hop culture and social justice. Additionally, Dr. Burnett Bailey, it's published in 2015, a book with the University of Pennsylvania Press entitled Pulse of the People, Rap Music and Black Political Attitudes. In 2017, she hosted the first pol political hip hop conference at Georgia State University entitled Behind the Music, Hip Hop and Social Justice, which examined the ways in which social justice is addressed and expressed within hip hop culture. In 2018, she was a Nasser Jones W.E.B. Du Bois Fellow with the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. She received her certificate in psychoanalysis from Emory University Psychoanalytic Institute. In 2020, she hosted Beyond the Culture, Black Popular Culture and Social Justice at Georgia State University. She is a phenomenal scholar, a phenomenal colleague, and I'm proud to call her friend. And ladies and gentlemen, friends and community members and everyone else, uh, Lakita Burnett Bailey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gales. So we're going to um, thank you also, Auburn Avenue Research Library. Thank you, Mr. Cox, and, and thank you, uh, Morris, as well, for hosting this and co hosting this series with um, the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University. We're going to go ahead and jump into this presentation. Give me a second to share my screen. So originally, um, when I usually do this presentation, when it's not recorded, I play rap songs. And I'm going to play snippets of the songs and try to limit it today be, um, because if we are recording it and posting it on YouTube, there may be some copyright issues as far as the videos that are in the um, presentation. But I definitely want to ensure that we, there are at least two songs that I will play in entirety to make sure that we grasp the importance of these hip hop songs as they relate to the Black Lives Matter mo uh, movement. Um, again, thank you for the introduction. This presentation today is entitled, This is America, Hip Hop and the Black Lives Matter Movement. Um, this research and this presentation is actually a chapter out of the edited volume, the forthcoming edited volume for the culture um, that Dr. Gales mentioned before. And so this is a chapter um, that I worked on with my graduate students to examine the relationship in the role of hip hop music in the Black Lives Matter um, movement. And so the idea behind this research is that culture is a method of resistance. So throughout history, Blacks have utilized culture as a method of resistance um, often voicing their concerns and discontent within the music, um, within their music, visual arts, literature, and poetry, while informing others of the injustices Blacks face um, within society. And so for this research, I had an overarching research question, and that question is, is hip hop utilizing both elite and mass participation strategies for inclusion and as um, resistance mechanisms? In order to answer that question, I conducted research looking at four case studies of police violence or death. Um, and these case studies were the case of Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Freddie Gray, and um, Sandra Bland. 
for the purposes of this research, we're going to talk in detail about the cases of Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, um, and Sandra Bland in order to keep it within our time frame. My hypothesis is that both elite and mass participation strategies are utilized by hip hop in order to inform others, but also as a resistance mechanism. And this falls in line with the uh, with the large number of rap songs that are discussing or de detailing police brutality and racial profiling um, within their music. Some of the songs are more popular that we are familiar with, like NWA's F the Police. Um, but you have other songs like Jay-Z's 99 Problems that talk about um, protections against illegal searches and seizures. A Chameleon Air, Riding Dirty is another that is discussing racial profiling. And so there are a number of songs within hip hop's history that deal with the issue of police brutality and racial profiling. Rap has long resisted um, police violence and racial profiling within the black community. And as an example of that, we will go into our first song, which is a more recent expression of resistance um, to police brutality as expressed by um, Atlanta native, The Little Baby. I'm gonna stop the song there again, as I said, for concerns of copyright issues, um, but definitely go and check out the entire video because Little Baby not only um, discusses issues of police brutality, but he also addresses the issue of COVID and the way that it impacts the community. But as you saw from the video, this video was actually shot here in Atlanta. And so you saw um, images of protests that took place this summer um, within the city of Atlanta, as well as images of the um, Atlanta police force. And so Little Baby is an artist who is not necessarily political. He is an artist that doesn't have a history of, of, of creating and producing political rap music, um, but he felt that it was necessary during the social unrest this summer and everything that was being experienced in the Black community to definitely talk about and discuss these issues and to provide more information about the issues um, within our communities. And so this is just one example and a contemporary example of ways in which hip hop artists are providing information and resisting issues of police brutality within, um, within the black community. And so in this research, I am particularly interested in ways in which hip hop artists have been, um, have participated politically. And so ways in which they have been involved in Black Lives Matter movement, dealing with political participation. And so political participation provides the mechanisms by which citizens can communicate information about their interests, preferences, and needs and generate pressure to respond. Um, within this research, um, we are looking at non-electoral participation. Often when we think about political participation, what people often think about and what is the easiest form and method of political participation is voting. Um, and so that is electoral participation. I am more interested um, in non-electoral participation, which is involvement in the community by participating in community organizations, contacting public officials, attending protests, marches or demonstrations, and affiliations with non-political organizations. Um, and this method is also very important considering who the hip hop um, generation represents. This is often a group that is marginalized, often alienated from the um, traditional forms of participation from forms of electoral participation who vo whose voices are not necessarily a part of the national political agenda. And so we know that when you are alienated and marginalized from the political agenda, then you utilize more often non-electoral forms of participation. So you participate in areas where you have access, such as your community, uh, you participate in community organizations, you will participate in marches or demonstrations in order to have your voice heard. In looking at participation, I'm interested in the ways in which hip hop artists are participating on um, as elite participants, as well as grassroots or mass participants. And this is important because while hip hop artists are a part of the mass um, public and are a part of this marginalized community that I spoke of before, because they are artists, they are also a uh, representation of the elite in the black community. They are celebrities. They have a platform that many others do not have. 
And so it is necessary to look at both ways in which they participate um, through elite forms of participation, as well as grassroots of mass forms of participation. And when I'm looking at elite forms of participation, I am uh, particularly interested in ways in which hip hop utilizes power, so their wealth and their status to act as liaisons between citizens and political institutions. So in this chapter, I look at um, ways in which hip hop artists contribute money, contribute their resources, contribute their time, and lend their status and or platform in order to advocate on behalf of those who may be voiceless. And so when you're thinking about elite participation, this is primarily looking at the ways in which hip hop artists um, have participated and have lent their resources, whether they're monetary or time, um, to fight on behalf of Black Lives Matter. So for instance, if we take a look at Jay-Z, his music streaming service held a benefit concert in 2015 to raise money for activist groups, including Black Lives Matter, um, hip hop adjacent um, act who was recently featured at the Super Bowl the weekend donated $250,000 to the Black Lives Matter Network in 2016. And um, other hip hop ad adjacent acts such as John Legend hired food trucks to provide free meals for Black Lives Matter protesters during the protests in New York following Eric Garner's death in 2014. So again, some hip hop organizations founded by hip hop elites have organized marches, drafted letters and demanded action from the government against police brutality, including Russell Simmons Hip Hop Summit Action Network. Thus elite strategies have continued to be a method of participation for hip hop while also incorporating strategies of mass participation. So in this chapter, again, I look at elite participation, but I also look at forms of mass participation and these are typically your non-electoral forms of participation. So rap artists, um, participation in protests, demonstrations, community organizing, and membership in community organizations. In order to go further to understand how rap has participated in the Black Lives Matter movement, we need to first acknowledge and know the history of the origins of the Black Lives Matter, Matter movement. And so the Black Lives Matter movement was founded by three women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, um, who found, founded the movement after the acquittal of George Zimmerman after he murdered Trayvon Martin. And so oftentimes we think of the Black Lives Matter movement as beginning in 2014 or even 2015, but it was actually after the murder of Trayvon Martin. And for those of you who are not familiar, Trayvon Martin was murdered in February, 2012. Um, Martin actually just celebrated, would have just celebrated his birthday. Um, at the time when he was murdered, he was, a seven, he was 17 years old and he was gunned down by George Zimmerman after walking home from a local convenience store. Martin, who was unarmed, was murdered arguably because of racism and the stereotypes of Black men as menacing and threatening. The murder and death of Martin drew national and international attention because of the unjustified and unauthorized tracking and murder of Martin. It was also appalling that George Zimmerman, the perpetrator of the crime, was not arrested or detained on the grounds of a Florida statute, commonly referred to as the Stand Your Ground statute. Zimmerman argued that the murder was justified in self-defense of an unarmed youth and knew that nearly two months after the murder of Martin, George Zimmerman was finally arrested. So it took some time for him to arrest him. And we are actually um, put forth in the chapter that the reason that um, Zimmerman was probably was arrested was because of the involvement of hip hop artists and bringing light to the case of Trayvon Martin. And so um, there were a number of hip hop artists who utilized their social media platforms, who utilized their music, as well as utilized their status in order to bring more um, information and more notice to the case of Trayvon Martin. For instance, California rapper The Game stated on his social media account, for some reason, people don't think that they need any excuse to kill us, beat us, hit us, run us over, disrespect us, or anything like that. New York rapper Prodigy goes on to say on his social media account that to me, it's up to the police department out there in Sanford to handle that the right way. They were supposed to arrest him. Additionally, others such as Russell Simmons um, through his website, globalgrind.com created a Facebook page entitled Justice for Trayvon Martin. And so again, these artists, these um, artists utilize their elite resources and social media to bring more recognition to the murder of Trayvon Martin. 
However, it was people like Plies who weeks after Martin's murder, Plies released a tribute song for Martin entitled We Are Trayvon, of which 100% of the album sales were donated to the Justice for Trayvon Martin Foundation. So between February 2012 and July 2013, there were over a dozen rap songs that were um, created as a tribute to Trayvon Martin. And there were many other tributes by hip hop adjacent artists. And so there were a number of artists who actually brought attention, discussed the case of Trayvon Martin, discussed the case of his death and what actually happened to him. And there were many others who called for the arrest of Trayvon Martin. Again, the Black Lives Matter movement started after the acquittal of George Zimmerman when Alicia Garza wrote on her Facebook page, Black people, I love you, I love us, we matter, our lives matter. And that was co-signed with the hashtag Black Lives Matter by Patrice Cullors. And this started the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which was founded in two, 2013. So as I stated before, Trayvon Martin was murdered in 2012. It was 2013 when um, George Zimmerman was acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin. It was 2013 when the Black Lives Matter movement was born. As another example, just to see the ways in which hip hop has discussed the hip hop, um, has discussed the Black Lives Matter movement, specifically the murder of Trayvon Martin. Here is a song by uh, Yasin Bey, formerly known as Most Deaf, featuring Dead Press and Mike Flo. And this one I'm going to play in entirety because it is really important to hear all verses of the song to understand what these artists are saying and to see how these artists bring light to the situation by detailing the situation. And so again, that is an example of a song that actually provides details of the um, murder of Trayvon Martin, but it's also representing and presenting a resistance mechanism to the murder. And so in the song, um, we hear them talk about the details of the case, such as um, mentioning the Arizona iced tea and the Skittles that Trayvon Martin went to the store for. Um, they are also paying homage to Trayvon Martin by wearing a hoodie. Trayvon Martin was in a hoodie when he was murdered, and um, that was a method of protest that was utilized after his murder, that people were wearing hoodies at the protest. Um, as well, um, one of the things that George Zimmerman said through his phone calls that he had on the hoodie and he um, quote unquote looked threatening. And so this was again, um, an homage to Trayvon Martin, but also it provided information. And as you saw from the artist there, they were talking about um, various forms of resistance. Some that were definitely non, um, some that were definitely violent. So not in the vein of this nonviolence resistance that we have been um, informed about before. And so the Black Lives Matter movement was founded again after the murder of Trayvon Martin, but it was not, it was not until the murder of Michael Brown that we actually start to see a large um, usage of the Black Lives Matter hashtag and specifically usage of the Black Lives Matter hashtag by hip hop artists um, as well as doing protests. And so um, Michael Brown, was a, a resident of Ferguson, Missouri. He was an 18-year-old male who was approached by the police um, and um, the police officer, Darren Wilson. And again, I make sure that I say these individuals' names because we need to know who these perpetrators of these crimes are. And so he was the, um, approached by Darren Wilson, Wilson. There was an altercation that ensued and um, Michael Brown ran away from Darren Wilson and was shot a number of times. I believe it was eight times if I am correct in my details. And he was killed. Um, again, some of the shots went through his hands because he had his hands up um, during and he was resisting. Actually, uh, I'm not resisting. He was actually um, um, he was actually surrendering to Darren Wilson when he was shot all of those times. Michael Brown's case is controversy one because his hands were up and it was believed that he was surrendering. Um, he was also shot in the back, which no, we know that he was running away. So he was not a necessary threat. Although that is the um, excuse that Darren Wilson utilized for actually shooting Michael Brown. 
But his case was also very controversial because of the way that his murder was handled after he was shot. There was no direct response to try to get an ambulance on the scene and try to assist Michael Brown. Michael Brown's body laid in the street uncovered um, for a number of hours. I think it was three hours that he laid in the street uncovered. Um, and his family actually came to the site after they heard about the shooting and were not allowed to even go over to try to assist Michael Brown. And so it was definitely a tragic shooting of um, an unarmed male uh, within the city of Ferguson, Missouri. And what we found out later through Justice Department re uh, reports is that there has been a lot of tension within Ferguson and um, between the police and the residents there. And so from after Michael Brown's death, we have uprisings that occur in Ferguson, Missouri. And this is the first time, again, we see the use of Black Lives Matter slogan at protests and during uprisings. As far as hip hop is concerned, they utilize both elite strategies and grassroots mass participation strategies um, in order to um, resist the murder of Michael Brown, but also to bring information and provide information about the case of Michael Brown. In fact, um, the situation on the ground was covered by a number of hip hop artists. And so for those of you who are familiar or remember um, when the Ferguson uprising occurred, there were a number of hip hop artists, artists such as Talib Kweli and David Banner who were actually on the ground there and were given live interviews with CNN um, because there was a distorted view of the uprisings that were occurring in Ferguson. And people like Talib Kweli and David Banner were actually trying to lend their voice and give a voice to the voices and change the narrative and change the perspective of what was actually occurring in Ferguson, Missouri. At the time, it was people like Don Lemon on CNN and other news anchors who were um, painting the uh, participants of the uprising as thugs and they were saying that they were uh, participating in loot and rioting and burning things down but it was people like David Banner and Talib Kweli that gave context to what was going on and was demonstrating that everyone was not um, participating in violent matters and for those that were it's because they're angry because they had these issues um, with the police for a long time because they were angry in the way that Michael Brown was murdered as well as the way that his body was treated after his murder and the um, not allowing his family to actually help him or uh, in bringing in any type of help for Michael Brown. And so there were a number of leak strategies utilized. One, providing information on the ground about the events, as I stated before, people like Talib Kweli and David Banner, but there were also local St. Louis rappers such as T.W.O. Um, who was explaining how it was local rappers who informed the public of Michael Brown's murder. So when Michael Brown was murdered and he was laying on the street for those three hours, it was rappers, local rappers who were spreading the word through their social media account about the injustice that was occurring in Ferguson, Missouri, which led to the national media actually picking up the um, situation that was uh, unfolding in Ferguson, Missouri at the time. So again, many members of the media were initially denied access after the shooting. So it was up to local hip hop artists, um, according to T.W.O., who posted information and formed the hip hop networks who in turn disseminated the information of the unfolding situation in Ferguson. As I stated, people like Talib Kweli, Killer Mike, and David Banner appeared on, appeared on CNN, articulating the feelings of rage and sadness that were observed in Ferguson using their positions to give voice to the voiceless. It was Talib Kweli who, um, if you remember, famously got into an argument with Don Lemon over the way that he was reporting the protests in Ferguson and specifically the way that he was depicting the community as unruly. And then there were other artists and natives of the area of Ferguson, Missouri, um, such as Tef Poe, who wrote a piece in Time Magazine where he described what was occurring during the protests, his reactions and the lack of response from President Obama and a history of economic dep depravity in Ferguson, Missouri. So not only were hip hop artists participating, utilizing elite strategies, lending their voice, utilizing their status, their time and their resources. They also participated in grass um, roots of mass participation strategies. So there were a number of songs that made um, allusions to Michael Brown within their lyrics that discussed his uh, murder and discussed the case. It's also provided a response to how they would have responded. But there were also a number of rap artists who were on the ground participating in protests and some even organizing protests. For instance, St. Louis native, um, St. Louis, which is also in Missouri and is a neighbor to Ferguson, 
um, St. Louis native Nelly organized a protest after a basketball game of celebrities that featured people like Wale and Chris Brown. Um, there were others such as Jake Cole who took a group of people to Ferguson in order to participate um, in the protest. As I stated, Talib Kweli was on the ground there, Wale um, was on the ground in Ferguson, Missouri, and a number of hip hop artists participated even in their own cities. Um, after the murder of Michael Brown, T.I. participated in protests here in Atlanta that actually shut down the interstate. And so hip hop artists were participating um, using grassroots methods of participation in addition to elite strategies. And the lyrics that you have on um, the other side of the screen is just another example of ways in which artists use their songs to resist, to voice their discontent, their concerns um, about the murder of Michael Brown. And to provide more information about the of Michael Brown. Um, but there is one song that kind of captures many of the uh, murders that were at the height of the um, Black Lives Matter movement at the time it was found. So it talks about the murder of Michael Brown, the murder of Eric Garner, and the murder of Tamir Rice. And this song, again, we watch in entirety because not only are we looking at and listening to the lyrics that is presented in this song, but we are also looking at the way in which the video um, is actually conducted because the video has a significance of its own. And this song is War Zone by T.I. So again, with this song by T.I., um, I wanted to play it to the end so you can see the quote at the end to say the new racism is to deny that, the, that racism exists. And so um, T.I. created this video as a response to and as a resistance to this idea that all lives matter and blue lives matter. T.I. stated that if all lives matter, um, then if whites were murdered in the methods that um, black people were murdered, unarmed blacks were murdered uh, within the United States, that there will be a different response. And so he wanted to invoke this idea of the empathy that would um, be portrayed um, given to whites if they were murdered in the same way. Again, in this video, he depicted the murder of um, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, and Tamir Rice. Um, within this video, but he also alluded to and discussed a number of other murders that were happening, as well as the um, Emanuel Church massacre that occurred in Charleston, South Carolina um, during the Obama administration as well. And so not only are we being informed of um, various cases of the Black Lives Matter movement through hip hop, but we are also seeing the ways in which they are resisting and using their music in order to resist. And so this example of Warzone by T.I. is only one example of the ways in which um, artists have utilized their platform in order to inform others and to discuss things. I don't know if you were could hear or paid attention, but T.I. also alluded to a local case where there was a man who was found hung um, in Piedmont Park here that did not gain um, as much traction as some of these other cases that occurred during this time. And so T.I. actually alluded to that case as well. So again, informing people of things that are occurring outside of their community by utilizing their platform as well as their status as celebrities to inform others of what is going on in Black communities throughout the nation. Um, the other case study that we looked at in this case was the case of Eric Gardner, who was murdered in Staten Island. Um, Eric Gardner was accosted by the police again for selling um, Lucy's loose cigarettes in on the street in Staten Island, New York. He was placed in a chokehold that was deemed illegal and is also is still deemed illegal, and he um, counted. He stated that he cannot breathe. I can't breathe over eight times until he um, was killed and it was all captured on video. And so we often put Eric Gardner behind the case of Michael Brown, but Eric Gardner was actually killed before Michael Brown was murdered. However, people did not learn about his case until after, um, oftentimes outside of New York after the case of Michael Brown. And those um, that did, they um, gained more attention after the, after the officers that were a part of um, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner's murder. I think his name was Panto 
Lino, um, those officers after they were acquitted as well of the murder of Eric Gardner. And so as a response, hip hop was involved utilizing elite strategies. Um, so they used their social media platforms in order to discuss the acquittal of the officers of the case. They participated in organized protests and meetings with political representatives um, in order to um, protest the murder of Eric Gardner. So for instance, in New York, um, Jay-Z and Russell Simmons met with New York Governor um, Andrew Cuomo to discuss changes to the criminal justice system. And Jay-Z also helped to organize protests among NBA players at the time, um, players specifically from the Nets, and the, the Nets and the Cavaliers who were playing in New York at the time. He reached out to LeBron James and organized among the players. Um, LeBron James was a player for the Cavaliers at the time. New York, um, Jay-Z owned uh, shares of the Nets and he organized with the players to wear I Can't Breathe t-shirts um, in recognition of Eric Garner and the last words that he stated. And so this was done at a basketball game in New York in order to pay homage to um, Eric Brown. There were also a number of celebrities who were part of the cast of Selma who wore I Can't Breathe t-shirts during their New York premiere. Um, and there were boys and girls basketball teams on local levels who followed um, the example of the Cavaliers and the Nets and also wore I Can't Breathe t-shirts. Um, there were a number of people who were vocal in their social media accounts, such as um, Sean P. Diddy Combs, who was vocal after the Garner verdict. Um, Combs, Combs was also instrumental in working with civil rights leader Reverend, Reverend Al Sharpton in organizing support from the hip hop community for the Justice for All March in Washington, DC. And this was a march that was organized to protest um, police violence. As I stated, there were a number of ways in which elite strategies were utilized during this time. Um, and most properly was utilized in social media, artists such as Diddy, RZA, Rhapsody, Mr. Fab, Big Boy, and Will I Am um, shared their outrage over the decision, the acquittal via their social media accounts. And then still, there were a number of artists that participated in grassroots strategies. And so artists such as J. Cole, Nas, Russell Simmons, and Q-Tip were spotted marching in protests in New York City. Um, again, there were people like LeBron James who wore the I Can't Breathe t-shirts um, during this time. Vic Mensa protested um, during a protest in Miami. And there were others who wrote songs that referenced um, Eric Gardner during this time. And one of those is a song that's featured on the screen here, um, which actually has lyrics and talks about and specifically alludes to Eric Gardner during their song. And so there were a number of other artists such as Talib Kweli, Sticky Fingers, KRS-One, who released a song entitled I Can't Breathe, um, which featured Samuel L. Jackson and Eric Gardner's siblings also created a rap song um, that was entitled I Can't Breathe as well um, as homage to Eric Gardner. And as we saw in the song that we just viewed by T.I., um, he also references Michael Brown with the chorus, hands up, um, and Eric Gardner, hands up, can't breathe. And so he was combining the chants that were utilized through both of the protests of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner during this time. So as I said before, we utilize four case studies. I'm going to only talk about three. Um, my final case study that I was interested in looking at was this idea of how was hip hop responding as it related to women? Because we know that hip hop um, is very misogynistic and very sexist and often uh, regulates women and female artists to the um, background within the movement, I was curious to understand how they would react to the murder of Black women during the same time as a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so for that reason, we actually um, looked at the case of Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland was murdered in Hempstead, um, Texas. She, she was either, um, she was believed to be murdered, um, but of course they said that her death is a result of a suicide, um, but of course there were circumstances around her death. The videos that we did see 
from the dash cam camera definitely shows that she was um, detained for no reason other than um, the reason of questioning and uh, resisting the authority, so to speak, um, or disrespecting the police officer as he saw it um, because of her refusal at first to put out her cigarette and then her refusal um, to go along with the illegal um, search that was occurring of her vehicle at the time. And so Sandra Bland was a woman who many believe did not have reasons to commit suicide in the jail in the way um, that the police stated she was actually moving back to Hampstead, Texas to work at um, Prairie View University, the place where she graduated from. She is very excited about her job at the time and the prospects of her future. And so she had this traffic stop that actually led to her death. And Sandra Bland's case is very different than some of the other cases we saw before um, because it was labeled as a suicide. But there were many in the hip hop community that to state that she didn't believe that Sandra Bland committed suicide. And she um, actually went to and put on her social media an uh, image of Sandra Bland and saying this woman does not look like someone that would commit suicide. And then there were artists that participated um, in grassroots strategies um, that created protest songs for Sandra Bland. Um, some of these protest songs um, actually detailed the case of Sandra Bland. Some of them detailed the life of Sandra Bland. And we learned more about Sandra Bland through some of the artists that were creating songs about her. Um, there was, however, an unequal response um, in the Sandra Bland case and as far as a uh, political participation of hip hop artists. And this can be for a number of reasons. One, there were not a lot of protests surrounding the murder, the death of Sandra Bland because it was not depicted as a murder. Um, and so there were not a lot of people that were out in the streets protesting as we saw in the cases of Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner or Michael Brown. Um, so there was not as much access and possibility for hip hop artists to participate in protests, but there were a number of artists who were actually um, utilizing their social media and demanding an inquiry into her death through their social media accounts. One thing that we saw throughout um, hip hop and their involvement with the Black Lives Matter movement was ways in which artists who are not necessarily depicted as political rap artists utilize their platforms to discuss political issues that were occurring in the um, during the Black Lives Matter movement and in the Black community. And so this is something that is um, definitely unique from most of the literature who wanted to state that hip hop, um, specifically rap music was no longer political. And so we've seen ways in which hip hop has been involved, not only using their music, but also using their status um, and their resources and showing that they are still representing and they are a voice for the voiceless, representing those from their community, those that are marginalized, and those who may be alienated. Um, in conclusions, we see that um, hip hop music is still representing the Black community, is still representing that voice. It is a resistance mechanism for the Black community. Um, we see examples of hip hop imagery resisting police brutality. Hip hop artists are participating on the elite status, on the elite basis, as well as through mass um, political participation. And they are leading to increased group consciousness and increased group participation. Hip hop still is a voice for the marginalized and the alienated within the United States. And we are seeing more and more examples of ways in which hip hop is participating politically. Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Bennett Bailey. I got my light fixed here. Um, uh, wonderful presentation, and we have uh, a little time for Q and A. Uh, you know, I know we have uh, a class that is attached to the Freedom School, and hopefully, we'll get a question from one of our students. I'm not going to call any names, but I know who you are. Um, but we already have one question, and so I'll, I'll post a question. And this question is from um, Ricky. How can we combat the negative views that Black Lives Matter is getting, stating that Black Lives Matter has ties to Antifa and is looked at as a terrorist organization? 
I mean, I think that that is the case when you have um, any type of organizations. When we even look at the civil rights movement, there were negative views and negative depictions of the movement who was um, primarily, I mean, always a nonviolent movement primarily through, during the civil rights era. And so a way to combat that is to for the Black Lives Matter movement to continue to um, resist in the manners that they resist, continue to have a presence in our society and they can disassociate themselves from um, Antifa and show that they are not aligned with them. This summer was interesting um, because we saw something that we didn't see when Black Lives Matter was first founded, um, when we first see the first evidence of protests in the Black Lives Matter movement, is that we saw more people outside of the Black community that were participating in protests. And this is what led to some of those ideas that the Black Lives Matter movement was associated um, with Antifa, and we have seen some examples of ways in which Antifa and some conservative um, protesters have tried to co-opt the Black Lives Matter movement and um, tried to paint it as, as a movement that is violent and participating um, in protests, violently looting, or even, you know, we've seen examples of ways in which those that were um, destroying property were not associated with the Black Lives Matter movement. And so I think it is um, one way that they resist this is by coming out and saying that those are not members of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so we just have to have people that stand up for that. I mean, even when we saw the, um, the insurrection that happened on the 6th of January, the first thing Trump said was it was Antifa, right? So trying to, again, depict Antifa, but all of those people had on Trump hats. So we know that that wasn't true. And I think Black Lives Matter has to stand up um, and say the same thing, that no, these were not members of our organization. Another interesting aspect with Black Lives Matter, however, is that Black Lives Matter movement um, and the way that it was founded and from the founders, they wanted it to be a national movement, um, but that had its leadership um, provided by chapters. And so they are different ways in which different chapters have moved within the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, they are just now centralizing some of the, the tactics that they utilize during their protests, but it is not the same on all states and through all members of the Black Lives Matter movement. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, staying with Black Lives Matter, we have another question. Do you see Black Lives Matter and trap music being a viable tool in the movement? I do. I mean, I mean, this is what I study. So I, I absolutely do um, think that, you know, one thing I'm looking at is the way in which music, um, specifically rap music has transcended from its origins and the the group that it originated with and that it, it is now, a, it is the number one genre of music within the United States. Uh, and this is based on Nielsen charts, Billboard charts, and any other charts you want to look at. Rap music is the number one um, genre. And so we're seeing ways in which various demographics are listening to um, rap music and oftentimes listen to rap music that does not necessarily appear on the radio. And so I think rap music has a place to actually discuss issues that may not be discussed in mainstream media and can push forward the Black Lives Matter movement and push forward the agenda of the Black Lives Matter movement by highlighting things that are not discussed within mainstream media. And so I, and I think trap music has um, a way to, a role to play in that as well. I don't know if you know this, I think I utilize most artists from um, the local Atlanta area. Stickman lives here. So with the um, Trayvon Martin song, he is a person that lives here. Mike Flo actually lives here in Atlanta as well. And T.I., I didn't play the 21 Savage song, um, but all of these artists, um, particularly T.I. and 21 Savage and Lil Baby are artists that are known to be trap artists, right? And so they are, T.I. contends that he created um, trap music, but that is up for debate still. Um, but these are trap artists. And so these artists are utilizing their base and they're utilizing their voice to discuss issues. And one thing that, one reason I had the 21 Sa um, Savage song up there is because his first verse, he says that, you know, I don't usually talk about politics. I have to feed my family. So again, this idea that the industry is not interested in learning about politics, 
but he says that it was necessary for him to come out and to talk about these issues because these are things that are affecting his community. Um, and if he's going to be real and he's going to be true, then he has to talk about these issues. So I definitely think that trap music has a role in furthering the agenda um, and the knowledge of the Black Lives Matter movement. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Monet Haywood. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Why do you think the events of the summer led to so much more participation from people other than Black people? And I think uh, Monet posits that perhaps it's because the, these deaths were captured on video. But what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, I think there are a number of factors. I think um, one is that I think that there is more coverage and there was more coverage um, of some of these deaths and specifically I think in the graphic nature um, that George Floyd died. So I've never seen that video. I can't watch these videos, but from what I heard, you know, he was yelling out for his mother, um, people were around watching him in that eight minutes and 46 seconds that the police officer had his knee on his neck. I think for people that watched that entire video um, that it really had an impact. I, I also think that um, the more people participating was because of COVID. I think COVID had an impact in a number of ways. I think one that we were seeing the mishandling of COVID by the government. So it made more people um, distrustful of the government and made more people angry with the government. But I also think people had a lot more times on their, on their hands in order to sit around and to watch um, some of these things unfold, as well as times to get out and to participate in some of these protests. And I think people are, were, are definitely more angry and have been more angry um, since COVID. And so their participation um, is impacted not only by the COVID and being home and more people having access and the ability to participate because people, because the country was kind of, was shut down during the time, but also because of the nature of the killing of George Floyd, which sparked it. But then that was coupled, uh, followed by the murder of Breonna Taylor, as well as the murder of Amara Arbery, and then um, later Rayshard Brooks. And so I think that there was a, um, a number of murders that happened consecutively that impacted um, people participating as well, as well as people having the freedom and the ability to participate more so and people just being upset and outraged with the mishandling of COVID-19 in the United States. Right, so I have a question for you as the questions continue to come in. Um, I'm sure you've seen Byron Hurts, um, yes. Beyond Beats and Rhymes. So, so there's a moment where he's interviewing Buster Rhymes, I think uh, Q-Tip is in there and Talib Kweli. And so, you know, Byron Hurt is sort of bemoaning, the documentary I think is probably 20 years old now, but he's bemoaning the state of, the state of hip hop. I, I wonder what he would, what, what kind of documentary he would produce today. And he's complaining and trying to invite them to respond. And Talib Kweli makes this really interesting distinction between radio hip hop and real hip hop. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the hip hop that I generally, to which I'm generally exposed is on the radio. And because I have two young daughters, I don't listen to it, right? But I was wondering, especially with your research around political hip hop and your knowledge about the way in which hip hop is in many ways informed, at least what we hear on the radio, informed by corporate entities that are interested in profit rather than politics. You know, if, if you were to, give someone some advice on how to discover hip hop that is more political. How can they find those artists that are that are not so influenced by this the profit motive, if you will, not to do a black and white thing, but I think you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Um because I'm old and I don't listen to a lot of hip hop anymore either because I have children in the car and it's it's really hard to find edited versions of things. I know when Kendra Lamar came out I bought the regular version of his album plus the edited version so I could listen to it while I was in the car with the kids because I just didn't want them to hear everything. But I also needed to hear the real unedited version. Um, one of the things, I, I, I actually rely on my students. Um, so my students will um, bring me information. But the songs that I played for you tonight all appeared on the radio. And so these are songs that all were all a part of the radio. 
um, because I am a hip hop scholar, I follow a lot of these hip hop websites. And so um, I am aware of some of these songs when they come out. Uh, and just, I just listen to them and, and I'm a hip hop head. So I just listen to them like Cardi B's Up just came out and I saw that as soon as the video dropped and I have my thoughts um, about that. I might want to write an article um, about that and WAP. So we can um, definitely talk about that later, but I don't know. I mean, one thing that I write in my book is that because of the advent of technology, there are so many more ways to hear hip hop today than they were before, right? And so one of the arguments that was made in that video and that has been made about hip hop um, since the so quote unquote golden era is that there needs to be a balance of artists on the radio. And I agree that there should be a balance of artists on radio. And we know that there are ways in which even within the hip hop community, there are sub marginalized groups. BET came out and said, um, there's a rumor that BET said that they would not play artists like Dead Press and Little Brothers um, because their content was too intelligent for their audience, right? And so we know that there are ways in which some of these artists are um, sub-marginalized within the hip hop community. But I think that because we've seen the success and growth of people like Chance the Rapper and Kendrick Lamar, who were able to um, successfully make a career without going through a major label, without utilizing the radio and through word of mouth, um, that I think that we know that that is still a part of the hip hop community and still a power that they have. When we think about hip hop, how it first started, it wasn't on the radio. It was through word of mouth. It was through people telling other people about what was hot, what was the next song out. And people did not rely on the radio to hear the latest hip hop songs. They relied on um, just looking at new releases or relied on what other people told them. And I think those are still some of the same methods that people utilize today. Um, I think though that they have things like Spotify and um, iTunes and um, YouTube music. And so sometimes like I was in the Megan Thee Stallion mood, I just put my radio on Megan Thee Stallion when the kids wasn't around. And I just listened to all of these new songs and I'm, I can't, um, I'm an active listener. So I have to listen to the lyrics. I have to hear what they're saying. So I can hear um, the poetry that is inside of hip hop, but also it gives me more material to utilize. And so that's how I find music. I will, some days, or I have my headphones on and I'll just listen to a, a station um, of an artist that I might like and just see what songs come up in that station. So uh, let, let's, let's, you, you mentioned gender, you know, let's, let's talk about gender a bit. I remember when WAP first came out and, I, and a friend of mine who grew up in Southwest Atlanta, but now imagines himself as some kind of um, conservative, was, went on this texting th uh, spree with our group, me or my, me and my, my high school friends. And you would have thought that WAP was the greatest threat to black life um, in the history of threats to black life, even in this country. And so we got into a very intense debate about that. And, you know, that's even before I listened to the song or saw the video. So I, I wanted to know, you know, you mentioned that you asked for this. So I wanted to ask you your thoughts on WAP. And then we have a question from our colleague in sociology that I want to pose once you, once you uh, propose, you know, offer an answer. I, I like WAP and I think WAP was liberating. I actually um, have been going over this thesis in my head of how WAP could actually lead to, um, led to can lead to better reproductive health among black women. Hmm. And I say this because WAP allows women to be free to express themselves sexually in a community that is highly conservative, in a community where women are not supposed to talk about their sexual interests, their sexual desires, um, and, and definitely their sexual conquest or involvement. And so because of that reason, because women often have been silenced, women do not talk about issues that they may have with their body that could lead them to get information and guidance from other women that can lead them to go to the doctor to get things checked out. And oftentimes uh, women learn late about breast cancer because there is no um, safe space to talk about performing 
um, self monthly checks or women learn late about fibroids because there's no one talking about what are the signs to look for. I think by being open about sexuality and expressing the fact that Black women can be sexual beings without being stigmatized as Jezebels, and they can be sexual beings with people that they choose, I definitely think that that leads to um, a, a form of liberation. It gives a, a place to be open. It gives a space to talk about issues that may not norm normally be discussed um, within many circles, right? We, I was just talking to a friend about how, and it's probably too personal, but you know, my mom didn't tell me anything about shaving. You know, those were not things that we discussed. And these are things that, you know, as I have children, I, I have to make sure that I, I bring that to the forefront. My mom gave me a book on, uh, I don't even think she gave me a book. I think I bought a book on um, puberty and I learned everything I learned from there. It wasn't really any discussions about what was going on with my body or any changes like that. But I think by allowing these women the freedom to express their sexuality um, gives more people the freedom to have conversations about sexuality that leads to other conversations about reproductive health and the health of women's bodies. And so I definitely think um, that the, the music can be liberating, it's fun, and it, and it destigmatizes sexual interests um, and destigmatizes sex among Black women. And, you know, we understand the history of why Black women are reluctant to talk about their sexual interests because of stereotypes like the Jezebel, right? They don't want to be depicted because of stereotypes of the Jezebel, but also because of the ways in which women have been depicted within hip hop. So we're not going to um, completely avoid hip hop of being misogynistic and sexist towards women and identifying and calling them hoes and tricks and things of that nature, right? That women want to be respected and they have been taught that if they talk about being sexually open or sexually um, experimental or just even interested in sex and they may be classified negatively. So I think that this kind of eliminates some of that stigmatization that has occurred within hip hop, but also within a larger community. Thank you. Um, so our colleague, uh, Mindy Stombler, who is um, in the Department of uh, Sociology asks if she says she's curious if there are any gender differences in hip hop artists using Black Lives Matter messaging as political resistance? No, and I probably went through, I didn't find any gender differences, uh, Mindy. I probably went through my presentation really fast. Um, I tend to talk fast when I'm nervous and I tend to be nervous when I'm presenting, especially live. So, <laughs> um, so I probably neglected to say um, some of the female rap artists that were actually participating um, in the protests, but we're also utilizing their um, social media accounts to resist some of these um, issues of police murders that were occurring. Um, but one of the songs that I know I had on the slide was a song from Tink um, that dealt with the case of Michael Brown. And that is a, a, a female artist. Um, that is a, a woman artist, right? And so there are ways in which um, women have also um, participate in the Black Lives Matter movement and utilize their music to resist. And so, you know, people like Cardi B, um, Megan Thee Stallion have spoken out as some of the more popular hip hop artists, but also people like Rhapsody. And Rhapsody has a history of speaking out um, and discussing issues of Black Lives Matter. And she's involved in numerous social justice campaigns to reform um, the criminal justice system. So uh, women have been participating um, as much as some of their male counterparts. However, there still is disparities in the number of um, female artists that are that are within the hip hop community on the mainstream level. And so there are other artists like No Name who is not as mainstream, but who has been a huge advocate for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and she's gaining more popularity now because of technology and pe more people listen to her even though she doesn't appear um, necessarily her music doesn't appear in great numbers on the radio and so I do think that there are um, I do know that there are, are women artists who are also resisting um, police brutality through their music as well as through their social media platforms and as well as participating in protests. All right thank you you know I just I know that uh, we have um people attending and I just want to 
give a shout out to Frederick Cox and Auburn Avenue Research Library that are filling the the chat window with all kinds of resources, articles, books, uh, YouTube links, et cetera. Uh, so we have a few minutes left and I wanna close with the a question from Lorenzo Bailey that moves, um, potentially moves our discussion forward a bit. And Lorenzo uh, says, we see rap music being utilized to be a voice of the people. Uh, he wants to know if there are any instances where rap is used as a call to action. Um, yes, so some of the things that are discussed within this chapter is ways, as I stated before, for instance, Nelly organized a protest, but it's the ways in which artists have, um, have presented or talked about or brought forth protests, as well as have called others to participate um, and to act. And so one example that I think is more prominent during this time and it's the example of Killer Mike um, in a video that actually went viral after the acquittal of Darren Wilson in the case of Michael Brown where Killer Mike was actually doing a concert as um, with his co-MC uh, LP and he broke down on stage and he said that people need to um, pay attention. Um, he, is, of course, expressed his dismay, his anger, and his sadness at the judgment, but he also said that people need to pay attention and need to become more active in um, the political scene and, and within politics. And we've seen Killer Mike kind of leading that effort um, by campaigning for artists, endorsing artists, having conversations with artists, um, he is very involved here in the city of Atlanta. And so he was advocating and asking people to be involved in whichever ways um, they deem fit, saying that they can be involved in electoral politics, which we did not talk about as much in this chapter, or non-electoral forms of organizing and resistance. And Killer Mike is an example of someone that is doing both. And so I think that there are artists who are um, calling people to action, um, for instance, the Gina 6 protest that occurred, and this was years ago, um, but that protest was actually organized by Most Deaf. And a lot of people don't know that because it was people like Al Sharpton, Al Sharpton who was leading it, but it was organized by Most Deaf. Most Deaf wrote a letter asking people to come to Gina, um, Louisiana and to participate in the protest. So that protest was organized. So there is ways in which We, yeah, okay. We, we lost your audio at the end there. Okay. Just at the very end, if you could just say what you said at the very end. Um, so the last thing I said was that, for example, most deaf organized the protests, the Gina 6 protests in Gina, Louisiana. Okay. And so he was the person that wrote uh, the campaign and wrote the um, original petition asking people to come to Gina, Louisiana to participate in the protests of the young men there. And so he organized that protest. So we are seeing a number of ways in which our, our artists are actually issuing um, call to action. Thank you so much, Dr. Burnett Bailey. And I want to thank everyone that logged on, everyone that's, that um, is watching on Facebook Live. And we also, of course, want to thank our incredible community partner, Auburn Avenue Research Library. Uh, and we also want to thank you, Dr. Burnett Bailey, for your hard work in pulling the Freedom School series together. And I give you the last word here, anything you want to offer in closing. Uh, our next talk is next week. <laughs> And right. I do not know who is next. Do you have a schedule in front of you? I, I do. Um, let's see, let me pull it up. Um, you think I would have that uh, available. Freedom School schedule, I believe. No, that's the syllabus. Uh, I believe our next presentation is Dr. Tiffany Flowers. Um, it's a panel, Dr. Tiffany Flowers, who will moderate we have uh, Bridget Davis, Dr. Dorian Harrison, Tamara Moten, and Aaron Barry McCray, and Renee McNeil, who will be talking about advocating for Black children within educational contexts. And you can always go to our website um, at uh, Georgia State University. That's uh, aas.gsu.edu. You can also go to the Auburn Avenue uh, Library's website as well and all of our social media, their social media, and we look forward to seeing you next week.
Yes, and thank you. Thank you to Dr. Gales. Thank you again to Auburn Avenue Research Library. This has been a joy. And while Dr. Gales says that I organize these meetings, this is his baby. This was his idea. Um, this is all his brainchild. So um, thank you, Dr. Gales and the Department of African American Studies um, as well. Thank you.